Welcome to this live stream from Nationalmuseet. Today we're not in Oslo, we're in Lüster on the west coast of Norway and we're at Unes Stave Church. I'll give a small Norwegian announcement for our Norwegian viewers first. Hi, and welcome to this live stream from Nationalmuseet for Kunst, Architektur and Design. Today we are not in the Conservation Atelier in Oslo, but we are in Lüster in Unes Stave Church. Her er vi som en del av turnéen til Brudeferd i Hardanger, som er på turné i Norge. Og vi har med oss seniorkurator formidling Ellen Lederberg og konservator Laura Homer, som vil fortelle mer om både Urnes stavkirke og Brudeferd i Hardanger. Om du har spørsmål underveis, kan disse stilles i kommentarfeltet, og så vil vi stille dem til Laura og Ellen. Welcome to this live stream, and today we have bridal procession on the Harangefjord Fjord as our main painting in the series of Close Encounters. As I said, we're at a stave church in Western Norway. And the reason for this is that the painting is on a tour of Norway. You'll hear a bit more about this and about the painting from our senior curator of education, Ellen Ledberg, and conservator, Laura Homer. If you have any questions uh, along the way, please feel free to ask them in the comment section and we will ask Laura and Ellen to answer some of them after the talk. Welcome, Welcome in to Urnes Stave Church. Um, we are sitting here in one of our uh, old stave churches and behind us we have the national icon the bridal procession at the Hardanger Fjord. And in two days, we will celebrate our national day. Could it be more Norwegian, Laura? <laughs> uh, I don't think so, maybe <laughs> not. Um, no, it's uh, fantastic to be sitting here uh, in this really old, important uh, church. It's the epitome of, of Norway. And, uh, and with this painting sitting behind us um, equally, and uh, it epitomizes Norway. Um, and also exciting to see it in a different setting yeah. as well. We're so used mm. to seeing things in, on gallery walls, um, even in our studio. But this, uh, this painting is going to travel around Norway. It's so yeah. exciting and uh, to go to very, very unusual places. So, mm. yeah. Um, yeah, shall we begin with the, talking about the artists? Yes. Who painted this? Yes. That would be uh, a nice start. Rather rare that there are two artists working on the same uh, painting. But uh, these two guys, Tidemann and Gude, has done that several times. But the most famous motif is this bridal procession. And <clears throat> actually they met uh, during the trips in the western parts of Norway in 1843. And uh, Tidemann, born in 1814, was at that time a mature and um, uh, artist, as the well established. 29 years old, and Gude, he was only 18. But he was already painting and drawing, and one of his painting, paintings are just hanging in a hotel across the fjord here. So he was not so mature as Tiedemann, but they met here and they developed a very good company uh, working together. Mm. Mm. So uh, Tidemann, he was mainly uh, into painting persons, uh, how they were dressing, how they lived, uh, furniture, uh, houses, and Hans Gude painted mainly landscapes. And then you can guess who has painted what in this bridal procession. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so they, uh, they met in 1843, as you say, yeah, but yeah. They, uh, this painting dates from 1848. Yeah. So they didn't collaborate maybe until that point. No. Um, and this uh, is their first collaborative yes. work, uh, yes. I believe. Yes. Um, 
they they did others or yes they did uh, as you can see probably on your uh, screen now um, there is two other examples we have the um, uh, uh, what do you call it? The Spearing fish? Yes. This, no, oh, this, this is one the, is the, yes. the burial procession yeah, at the Song in the Fjord. Burial. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, and the other one is uh, Spearing fish at the Lake Krødern, as you can see here. Yeah. Um, and they were doing these collaborations for a period of around 11, 12 years. Okay, and mm. in uh, because we know that the uh, bridal procession yeah. Brudefad, um, is painted in Dusseldorf. Yes, at least the, the first couple of versions. Yes, um, were these also uh, painted in Dusseldorf? Yes, so, they were. Yeah. They were. Okay, mm. based on sketches made in Norway mm. during their trips back here. Yeah, <laughs> great. And uh, Tiedemann, he also worked together with other artists, and as you can see here. Uh, he is uh, working together with Martin Müller, and this is Sinclair land Landing in Romsdal, which is also in the National Museum collection. It's a huge painting. Oh yeah, yeah. fantastic. Do we know um, why they chose to collaborate? I mean, they're sort of, you know, Gouda was that much younger and not yeah. so established, but I mean, the, I, was there just mutual respect, I guess, yeah. um, and, and a kind of acknowledgement that one was the master of figures, one was the master of landscapes, yeah. and kind of let's get together yes. and, uh, and make the best, yes. best picture we can do. Yes, and they also both were living in Düsseldorf, uh, mm. Norwegian course, yeah. artists living abroad. Yeah. So they had some kind of a Norwegian uh, yeah. common yeah. 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 yeah, yeah, absolutely. Mm. Uh, that happens when you move abroad. Yeah, <laughs> you find yes. your uh, you find your friends from home. Yes, <laughs> you do. <laughs> so um, yeah, and uh, this, uh, as we say, is painted in Dusseldorf, and it was presented to the public in mm. this tableau vivant. Yeah, uh, thing. Can you explain what that is? Um, it's, uh, it's kind of a performance where you make a um, theatrical performance out of the motif. So you would paint a huge background, mm -hmm. like the one in the painting, and then you will make a boat, uh, maybe make a small stave church to put in the background, and then you would have um, persons yeah. sitting in the boat, a real fiddler, a real gunshot fired. Oh, wow. Yeah, and going along with music and uh, lyrics, of course, as you heard here in the beginning. Wow, what a fantastic way yeah, to present yes, art. It's, yes. um, we and don't really do that now. No, we don't. And here you see a, a photography of uh, one of these uh, tableaux vivants mm. from uh, in Norway in 1899. Yeah, from actually um, presenting bridal procession yes. in Hardanger. Yes, exactly. It's from, yeah. yeah. That's amazing. Why do we think the painting was so popular? Um, I mean, was it... I guess it was painted around the time when Norwegian national romanticism was at its height mm -hmm. and, uh, and Norway as a country and yeah. Norwegian culture were being defined. Is that, could that be a, a reason? Yeah, well, um, Norway was not a, a country that stood on its own feet because we were in a union with Sweden and there were strong forces who tried to make Norway an independent a nation. Uh, and in that discussion and in that thinking, this painting became very popular and it fitted very well in. Mm -hmm. So um, it's telling a, a very rich and strong story on uh, Norwegian culture. Yeah. Okay. So, yeah. So they really sort of chose, I mean, yeah, the thought about to pick out the the types of people and the yeah. slave church and yeah. all that, all yeah. the elements. Um, but it is kind of ironic because at that time not so many people lived this sort of uh, nice life no it was a lot harder than Absolutely. it kind of makes out in yes the yes so <laughs> so we have to remember that this is a very romantic mm. way to see it because of hard work long days little food uh, high uh, percent of the children were dying as children mm -hmm. so it was kind of a hard life compared uh, with today, for example. Yeah. yeah. The, the glossy version. Yes, yes. <laughs> and, and, and the popularity, uh, it uh, went down when we came towards the end of the 1800s. 
and another famous um, artist, Theodor Kittelsen. He was making a, a picture or a drawing uh, with his own um, thinking or thoughts around this theme. As you can see here, it's almost like a caricature of the bridal procession. Um, most of the people in his version are rather drunk, maybe even the priest, but he looks sober. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, more, more so than the others. Yes, so. and we will come back to that later yeah. on. Yeah, yeah. Mm. But uh, I mean, it, sort of peasant weddings and and that, they had a, they have a tradition yes. in uh, oh, yeah. in art history. Yes, uh, we do. think to the Flemish uh, artists and um, of that mm. period. They they're slightly different. In, yes, in tone, shall we say, yes. they're a much more comic almost than a, a sort of erotic. Absolutely. And, um, yes. Yeah. Uh, there isn't really so much of no. that in this. It's no, a no. bit more serious. Maybe. Absolutely. There is no uh, eros and no comedy in this. This is a serious uh, day in a serious young couple's life. <laughs> yeah. So, so there is no, uh, but. Even so, it's in this tradition of uh, gripping into uh, a motive from the peasant's life. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and just be yeah, a very, yeah, taking it seriously and, and, yes. and, kind of, and presenting Norway in a very serious way and, yes. and the Norwegian yes. culture and, and, and the country. And I mean, it's an extremely positive, happy image. Yes. Um, the weather reflects the mood, Absolutely. celebratory mood. Absolutely. Um, but it is. Uh, they they did seem to take artistic license with the oh, yeah. with the landscape and the oh, yeah. costumes, and maybe to make it even more Norwegian, more mm -hmm. sentimental. Yeah. Than the. Yes, but because there are several persons has tried to to identify the actual place, uh, but there is uh, if it's here in Lustr, if it's in Hardanger, which is in the title. Yeah. Uh, or it could be down uh, near Odda in Sandvinvatne. But I don't think you ever will find out because they are based on sketches that Hans Gude made during his traveling in Norway. Yeah. And he has made his own uh, ideal landscape. Yeah. And you have the glacier, you have the fjord with the green water, you have the stave church. Mm. And there is a lot of yeah. elements that he has picked up on his travels. Yeah, there, that he will have seen for real. I mean, mm. the, the, all these elements exist. I mean, even, even the green water. I remember when at first moving here and seeing this painting, thinking, what, I mean, water so green. Is yes, it, yes. Uh, whoa, is it real? Um, but it really is. Yes. And so all these elements are, are real. Yeah. Um, and he definitely depicts reality, but kind of this, yeah, a, a fake reality. Yes, <laughs> yes. You want to yes, put it like that. Because yeah, um, we actually have letters from him saying mm -hmm. that uh, there's one dated the 22nd of March, 1854, mm -hmm. which refers to at least one of the versions of yep. um bridal procession. It says, I, I paint a high mountain picture from the edge of Kvinharad's or away towards Morange. I do not know exactly where because I was not there. That is to say, I was in both Kvinharad and Morange but it was nowhere to be seen. And I kind of think that sums it up. It was, like, yeah. you can't see this in nature, no, this no. exact view, it doesn't exist. Yeah. And I mean, it's also, Tiedemann also took liberties yes. with the costumes. Yes, he did. And he was also making a lot of uh, watercolors showing how people were dressed. And he used these during his uh, way mm. to uh, paint the different persons in his um, paintings. And here you can see two of the, his watercolors showing brides. And if you again look at the uh, painting behind us, you will see that you can recognize some of the elements on this bride. So she is dressed in a sort of costume that is connected to Hardanger or the western parts of Norway. But uh, we do not know whether she is actually from Hardanger. Mm -hmm. And even the groom has a folk costume, but not from the same area. So he's, uh, yeah. He's from somewhere else. Yeah. Yeah, yeah it's, um, it's interesting actually, because Gude uh, uh, also used, it, it seems that he used Tiedemann's sketches as well um, in some of the paintings that he did for himself yeah. uh, and by himself, uh, which is quite interesting that they shared 
They shared sketches. Yeah. Um, and he equally took liberties uh, mixing up costumes from various different regions of, of the country. And I think uh, you can see this in From Balastran, uh, which is showing on your screens now. This, this painting is also dated to 1848, same as Bridal Procession. Um, it's been recently acquired by the National Museum. Uh, we're very pleased to <laughs> very yes. pleased to have oh, yeah. it. Yeah. Um, and the the woman walking the the detail in the top left of your images shows the woman walking with the child has a has a costume from Hallingdal, um, while the woman sitting in the rocks um, in the sh under the rocks in the shade uh, the detail shown in the bottom left uh, that is uh, much more from Hardang area. Um, costume. So again, he even he has sort of mixed it up and and just picked what looks best, I guess. Yes. In the, in the particular image. So. Yes, and and he might have borrowed uh, or looked at uh, Tiedemann's uh, watercolors and sketches, mm. but he can also ha has uh, uh, had the opportunity to borrow uh, some f pieces from the collection of folk costumes that belonged to Adolf Tiedemann. So here you can see one of uh, these pieces now belonging to the Folk Museum in Oslo, uh, a vest, uh, and he also had other parts of the costumes and a lot of uh, traditional jewelry that he could put on his models uh, when he needed it. Wow, so he really could just pick and choose. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so if we turn to uh, the painting itself, uh, mm -hmm. Bridal Procession, we could sort of talk a little bit about um, how it was made. Yeah. Um, obviously, two artists collaborating could be sort of made in a slightly different way to, to normal. Um, and we know that, uh, obviously, we know that Gouda painted the landscape, being the landscape painter, and Tiedemann, um, the master of figures, painted the, the figures. Um, we also know from Gouda's diaries that the painting remained in Gouda's studio in Dusseldorf and that Tiedemann went to Gouda's studio to paint his sections. So the painting didn't move between studios, um, but it was in, it was in Gouda's. And a thorough and clo a close examination of the surface and paint layers revealed that Gouda actually painted the landscape, leaving what we call reserves, kind of unpainted passages. Um, in areas of the landscape where the figures would be. So um, he sort of would have painted around in the, in the, the water and left a sort of section where the boat and the figures would be. Um, and you can actually see this in, uh, when you examine it under, my, under the microscope I and mean, the details showing on your screens now um, hopefully show this. Uh, the one on the left is a close-up of um, the rower's arm and left hand. And you can see the blue and green brushstrokes of the water extending just underneath the brown of the figure's clothing. Um, however, the blue of the water stops quite abruptly just a couple of millimetres in uh, from, from the edge of the, of the figure. Um, and in, the, in this detail image, I hope it's clear, in the sort of lower left of, of that image, you can see it's much more sort of uh, bright brown, or like golden brown underneath the, the upper layers of paint rather than the sort of blue-grey of the water. Um, showing where the ground is exposed. Uh, and in other areas, and this example on the right of your screens, um, shows that the, uh, the outlines of the figures are actually kind of, the artists have gone back in and sort of emphasised the outlines and made sure that they're sort of filled in so that no ground is exposed and that, that, that there's no unpainted areas. Um, and there's a sort of darker, slightly different coloured uh, paint passage um, in the detail on the right, um, which hopefully you can see uh, is, is that. So it's yeah, showing that they kind of, they worked together, one did one bit, then the other went back in, and, and then they sort of came mm. back again to, fi to finish it off. Mm. Do we know who actually finished it off? Was it the, uh, the, <laughs> the most established Tiedemann, or was it the youngster? Yeah, don't know. No. <laughs> <laughs> We're not sure. Um, it's, uh, yeah, I, it, we, we can only speculate. Um, it's, it's possible that it was Tiedemann um, who finished it off. Uh, the brush strokes, although they look sort of similar mm -hmm. on the first glance, um, close up, they're actually slightly different in exact tone and consistency to the rest of the surrounding landscape. Um, so it's, it's possible that it was a slightly different paint. Um, maybe Tiedemann ground his own paint, it's sort of, slightly coarser. Mm -hmm. um, we're not sure, than, rather than Gouda's. 
But uh, yeah, uh, we, all we can say is that we see the same characteristic on the other collaboration that yeah. we have that's in the National Museum yeah. collection, Spearing Fish mm -hmm. on uh, Lake Rotheren. Um, and that, that has the same, the same sort of features of, uh, out of following the outlines and sort of going back into finish off. Yeah. Um, well, the materials and, um, and, uh, used by the artists are fairly typical and standard for the, for the period. Um, and we know that uh, Tiedemann and therefore most likely Gouda um, and kind of all, all uh, artists that are associated with the Academy in Dusseldorf bought their art supplies from this, uh, from one of the best suppliers in Dusseldorf, actually, uh, Stefan Schoenfeld, mm. um, who had run a specialist shop um, for artist materials since 1829. Um, so we're pretty certain that that's where they bought their materials from. Um, and it was probably likely as well that this uh, supplier provided the canvas um, already prepared with ground layers on. Oh. Um, the ground layers are fairly standard of the, of the, of the time from artist suppliers as well. There's a, um, you, you get sort of this very coarse um, underlayer that sort of fills the canvas weave, the interstices of the canvas weave to fill it in and, and smooth it out. And that's generally is kind of a dark brown, um, very cheap materials. And then over the top of that comes this lead white layer, which yeah. is much brighter, more luminous. It's much smoother. And it was meant to provide that sort of that smooth, luminous surface on which to paint. Mm. Um, and it's very standard for, for commercially primed mm -hmm. uh, canvases at the time. Um, and this, uh, this artist supplier, you can see a, a little picture on the right of your screens. Um, uh, that's just an, uh, a little advert or um, uh, yeah, poster from the from the shop, actually of his son uh, Fritz. Uh, I think it was a Fritz. I'm not sure. Felix, yeah. maybe. Felix, Felix oh, yeah. uh, Schoenfeld yeah. uh, in Dusseldorf from slightly later on. Um, but uh, yeah. Um, but uh, interestingly, as well, 1848, when this uh, painting was was made, um, is right around the time of the development of the collapsible metal tube which is ah. the tubes that we know sort yeah. of, of today that yeah. oil paint is, uh, is supplied yeah. in. Um, but prior to 1841, not so long before this painting was made, uh, artists had to hand grind their pigments mm -hmm. in oil mm. um, and then store them in pig bladders. And there's an image of yeah. that on the left of your screens. Um, this was a really time consuming process. Um, and it also, the paints didn't last very long before they had to be made new again, so maybe a couple of days only, mm -hmm. um, because of course the pig's bladders were slightly porous. Um, so the advent of the metal tube, 1841, by Windsor and Newton, changed everything. Um, and Gouda, for one, was really quick to adopt this, uh, this new sort of commercial invention. Mm. Um, I guess no doubt because it's small size, it was uh, um, low weight, yeah. it provided possibility for longs, long term storage, yeah. um, and just uh, it was overall much more convenient, especially yeah. for travelling, which obviously Gouda and Tiedemann both mm. did. Um, That's quite so. interesting. Yeah. <laughs> I've never been thinking about Gouda as uh, being progressive and avant garde, so but no, well, maybe it's because he was a rather young man yeah. and he could easily adopt this new yeah he uh, he's not the most avant-garde no. that's for sure um or progressive you are right in that um but certainly i think this like i say it's the overall convenience of this was was enough mm. to 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 make them adopt it quite quickly because mm. he really um the research into Gouda specifically, uh, but Tiedemann as well, they they really were not progressive artists in the, yeah. in the sense they were quite conservative in yeah. their choice of pigments um, and materials. They chose the very commonly available, um, stable, reliable pigments. Um, and an analysis has shown things like cobalt blue, ultramarine blue, bone black, lead white, mm. earth pigments, the very standard yeah. pigments for the time. They weren't. They didn't really uh, start using any of the kind of new pigments. No. Um, maybe because a lot of them were adulterated versions of existing pigments. Um, other ones were sort of so new that their stability was unknown. Um, they would often fade over time. Hmm. Uh, so it's possible for that. I don't know. Um, but they certainly were not 
progressive in no, that way with their no, materials. No. Um, and Gita equally, he wasn't that um, uh, exciting in the application of his paint either. It's quite smooth um, in application and the colours tended to sort of be blended with quite low impasto. Mm. Uh, it's very typical of his early works. Um, he did become a bit more confident and freer with his handling of the paint later in life. Uh, and you certainly see this in the kind of later works from around the 1870s mm -hmm. when he was in Karlsruhe. Yeah. Um, and there's a lot more sort of impasto and, and life to the, yeah. to, the, to the paint, to the brush strokes. Mm. Um, and he... <laughs> He might be called the master of the skies. Yeah, um, but, the Luft Doctor. Yeah, the yeah. <laughs> Luft Doctor. But um, to me, it, certainly in this painting and also in the, from Balestrand, um, it's the rocks and the and the and the foreground that really really yeah. get me. Yeah. Um, and you see here this this rock here. Mm -hmm. it, the way he depicts that is quite astounding. Um, when you driving around th these areas. I was kind of blown away. I had to struggle to keep myself on the road, yeah. <laughs> distracted by these rocks that it's yeah. like, oh, this identical to how he yes. painted it. it yes. was, I felt like I was in this yeah. painting. Yeah. It was really funny. I know this of the like rocks too yesterday. Yeah. yeah, this sort of the way that they're so speckled um, with and moss covered mm. and, the, and the sort of greens and reds and the mm. greys and the blacks. Mm. It was uh, so I, to me, <laughs> he's the rock doctor, not the rock <laughs> doctor. Um, but no, no, I just found it really fantastic and. Uh, but Tiedemann, yeah, he's quite different in his application yeah. of paint. Yes, yes. Um, he's much more free, much more confident. Mm -hmm. um, and he often applied sort of, uh, highlights and, and upper layers before the underlayers were fully dry, um, which resulted in blending and dragging of the colours on the surface and wet in wet, 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 in wet brush strokes, yeah. um, which produce really beautiful colours and combinations. Um, and there's two details showing on your screens now. Um, the left is a detail of the fiddler. We are, we drag brush strokes sort of through the, through the bow um, and, and around his clothing. And the detail on the right shows the shirt and the jewels on the chest of the bride's mm. uh, wedding, um, wedding gown. Um, just really, really beautiful and intricate the way the, the, the colours blend yeah. um, in his application. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, do we know anything about how they actually started or did they draw, drew up the motif or...? Yeah, I mean, of course, we know so much about the sketches they did beforehand, which yes. they used. Yes, yes. Um, but they... We actually have found out also quite a lot about their drawing um, on the canvas. Yeah. Uh, and sort of sketching out the, the design on, on, the, on the support. Um, we, in 2015, um, 16, we examined the painting um, mm. and actually several others of, of Gouda. Mm. Um, and we did this with microscopes and infrared technology. Uh, and infrared essentially allows us to kind of look beneath the surface of a painting. And we can see things, it detects carbon-based materials. So it really shows us things that are done in charcoal or um, pencil or carbon-based inks. Hmm. Um, and this was often could reveal underdrawing um, and sketches beneath the paint layers. Interestingly, um, we found almost no drawing in the landscape using this method, mm -hmm. uh, which is kind of fascinating given that Gude is quite methodical yeah. um, in how he paints uh, and not so free. Um, but so we examined it uh, with a microscope mm -hmm. and found um, this very sort of almost transparent, quite fluid, uh, sort of red-brown medium. And so you could see quite sort of clearly actually through the, with the, just with the microscope in some areas um, following a, the mountains. Um, and hopefully you can see this in the detail on the left of your screens now. Um, this sort of little, is almost like a slightly horizontal red line through the through the through the mountains, the paint of the mountains, based on its visual appearance, mm -hmm. and given that it doesn't show up in infrared, we assume this is sepia ink. Um, yeah. Sepia ink was a relatively common medium for sketching and drawing at the time. Actually, um, in fact, it was used by the German artist Caspar David Friedrich. Yeah. Um, so he, yeah. Uh, so Gouda, it seems quite common for Gouda to have used this. Um, we've certainly found it on several later works um, and sketches by him. 
uh, as well as on um, from Balastran. And that is the detail of that painting on the right of your screens. Slightly harder to see than the, than the uh, bridal procession detail. But just around the sort of top of the, the mountain shape, there is a slightly dark red-brown mm -hmm. um, line uh, you can just see in certain, certain areas around that, showing that it's the same material that he used to draw. Um, so, yeah, I'm quite, quite like to look further at some of these uh, other paintings to see yeah. if we see more, because it, we can't use sort of standard no. techniques. Well, um, the, the painting from Balsran we have had in house just for a couple of weeks. Yes. So there is a long way to go yes. to discover more. Yeah, there is. Yeah. yeah so to reveal the the mm. underlying yeah. Yeah, things. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So so but, but about uh, how about Tiedemann? Does he work in the same way or uh, they uh, couldn't be more different in the way they <laughs> <laughs> at this point having been quite similar with the painters they couldn't be more different with their drawings. Um, while Gu remains quite true mm -hmm. to his original shapes and, yeah. and forms and, and the drawing he follows it quite accurately um, with only sort of really minor adjustments. Tiedemann, um, yeah, he's much more free again. Um, mm. He uses a much drier medium, not this sort of painted fluid medium. Um, it's possible it's graphite pencil or yeah. the carbon-based ink applied with a quill pen. Oh. And the appearance in infrared is very sort of scratchy, sketchy, Mm -hmm. um, quite fine lines, so very, very different. Um, and he, Tiedemann continually reworked and adjusted elements of the, of the painting and the composition. Most alterations were quite small changes, mm -hmm. um, minor sort of adjustments to, to, to the precise placement of a figure. But there is one very dramatic change in composition that we discovered in this painting, and what? that is right here. Uh -huh. um, so in normal light, you don't really see anything. No, no. Uh, <laughs> but in infrared, um, which hopefully is the detail is showing on your screens now, um, it revealed that uh, initially Tiedemann had the musician at the back of the boat. He was standing up and facing out towards the viewer, um, while the gunman was sort of leaning back slightly and the, and the gun was lifted slightly more up into the sky than it mm -hmm. is now, only slightly. But, but the musician now, I mean, it's much less prominent uh, and sitting down, facing towards the newlywed yeah. couple. Um, and so, and in, um, yeah, in the infrared image on the right of your screens, uh, you can really sort of clearly see the, the figure of this standing person, yeah. sort of very broad, almost, uh, yeah, kind of dominating almost. Yes. Um, so I guess he <laughs> decided it was too dominating uh, and changed it. Um, but there were also um, minor changes in the distant figures that lead up to the church, uh, the stave church up there. Mm -hmm. There's sort of figures taken out and some put in in different places. Ah. And, um, and also just minor adjustments around the, the bride and the groom yeah. and the hat, um, which again, another, ver uh, another detail is showing on your screens. So. so, so when you have revealed these secrets, mm. yeah. um, <laughs> do you think that can tell us anything about um, which version we are looking at now? Because um, there are several versions of this motive made by Tiedemann and mm. Gude. Yes. Six or seven. And one of the big questions um, is, is uh, this the first version or is it the second? Um, wise guys have been discussing uh, this and um, I do not have the answer, but maybe you have. <laughs> Sadly not. No. Um, yeah, it's a, it's a great debate, isn't it? Yes. Um, yeah, well, I can just add to the debate and uh, with what we know, we can, uh, again, it's speculation. Yeah. Um, but the, the facts of these changes, mm. I mean... <sighs> Pentimenti and these sort of changes in composition, as they're, as they're called, um, they are often seen as proof of, of a first version of something when the artist or artists are first working out the composition, all the details where the figure will stand or sit or, and, and those sorts of things. So given that there are several areas with these sorts of changes, um, you could speculate that it is the first version mm. um, and not the second as has Quite, for a, quite a long time been accepted yeah. that it is the second version. Mm. Um, but, I mean, to be really 
really certain if that's a, a, an argument, we'd have to examine all the versions that yeah. we could yeah. <laughs> um, and to see if there was any of these similar changes in those. Mm -hmm. mm. So. Mm. And at the moment we do not know where they all are, so no, we have to problem. be a bit of a Nancy Drew to figure that yeah. out. <laughs> <laughs> a little bit. Yes. <laughs> Um, yeah, mm -hmm. and I mean, it's it's not unheard of to make changes no. in later versions no. anyway. It's a bit, um, yeah, it often depends if the artists see later versions as copies. Yes. Um, or as development and mm. a, a, wor a work mm. art in themselves mm. um, with, its own, with their own sort of creative value. Mm. Um, and in the case of Bridal Procession, it could be that the painting was no longer available for copy. Yeah. Because um, it had supposedly been sold. Mm. the first version. Um, but I, even more likely is that Tiedemann and Gouda saw it as um, a chance to improve on what yeah. they had done before, that they didn't yeah. see it as just a mechanical copy. No. Um, that really it was a work in its own right. Uh, and in fact, each version is different. Yes. So they aren't all just copies of, no. of, the, of each other. And we have two letters written by Gouda. Um, one in November 1848 mm -hmm. to his fiancée, and the one in 1895 to a descendant of um, version number three, as we'll <laughs> call it right yeah. now, um, stating that these later versions are not meaningless copies um, and that he and Tiedemann had done everything mm. to ensure that it was better than the original. Yeah. So they really wanted to make improvements. Yes, so. yes. And as far as we know, they are all different. Mm. Uh, well, we haven't seen all, but no. the one we have seen, they are different, uh, yeah. even in size and also how to present the motif. Mm. Yeah. So, but um, if we suggest that the version we are having here, which belongs to the National Museum, is the second one, mm. uh, we do not know where the first one is today. It has mm, maybe been destroyed, uh, during several wars in Germany, because it appeared to belong to a German. But we do not know for certain. Uh, and uh, if we think that uh, the National Museum's version, as you see it now, is the first uh, one, then they have painted six different versions, but if it is the second one, then it's seven versions. Okay, did you get that? <laughs> <laughs> I think so. Yeah. Well, let's, let's say that this is the second version. Yeah. Which and, we'll... and yes. And uh, what was happening in 1848 was that the Art Society in Oslo, they um, learned about this painting and making, had made a big success in Düsseldorf. And they ordered another one from Tiedemann and Gude. Oh. So they painted this on commission. Uh, and the Art Society in Oslo, they had a big lottery in the autumn of uh, 1848. And it was um, uh, won uh, by uh, Mr. Fucht from Moss, in, uh, not far from Oslo. Okay. So, and if we now just go through these different versions, as we suggest they are yeah. today. <laughs> uh, you will uh, now on your screen, I hope, see uh, what we call version three. That is mentioned in a letter from Gude to his uh, fiancée mm -hmm. Betsy Anker in 1848. And he's telling about some changes he is doing. Uh, everything is much more fresh and greener than the other one. And today Tiedemann came to my studio stood by my easel and painting Ole Bull as the fiddler. At that time, Ole Bull was a world famous Norwegian fiddler and composer. The painting, version three, was bought by the lawyer Bernard Dunker. And this version of the painting was probably shown at the World Fair in 1855, where it won the gold medal, second degree. And this painting is now in a private uh, home mm. in Norway, okay. as far as we know. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. Uh, and if we go to the version number four, uh, it was painted in 1853. And as you can see, it's quite different from the other ones. He has, uh, or they have changed the composition rather much.
much. Mm. Yes. And it was made on commission from uh, a consul, uh, General John Crow in Oslo, and he used it as a present to Lord Elsmer in London. And we know that Lord Elsmer was very happy about it, and he had a huge art collection, and this painting had a very central uh, place in his uh, present of his collection. Mm. Um, yeah, it's so different to the first yes. two, because the, both the ones painted 1848, the sort of our version and the, and the Dunker yeah. one, they're, they're much more similar. Yes. In the sort of stave churches and the, and the positioning of the boat. And yes. This one is uh, quite dramatically different. Yes, and, and we see now that the two boats are uh, uh, drawn closer towards the foreground, towards us as a uh, viewer, viewer, and the boat with the newlywed couple is now seen from the side. And the, the gunman has uh, changed his uh, rifle into a revolver. Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, and, and the fiddler is placed aft, and in front of him there is a drummer included as well. And we have a long tradition of using drums um, celebrating a wedding here in Norway. Okay. Yeah, yeah. And um, there is uh, existing a drawing by Tiedemann uh, where we can see how uh, he has uh, made the motif and how he has written down notes on what colors to use. So that's uh, interesting. quite interesting to see that he had already mm. decided what colors. Uh, to use in the painting. Yeah, it, really interesting actually, because it's also, it suggests that that's the sort of sketch. Yeah. And that potentially there wouldn't be so many changes on on the actual canvas that you mm. see, mm. whereas we do get that in, in this, uh, in, in our version of uh, Bridal Procession. Yes. That he's kind of worked it all out. Yeah. In advance. And we think that this version four, um, owned by Lord Elsmer, was brought back to, to uh, Norway from England by the art collector Gustav Skarmarken in 1914, actually. Oh. And there was a big um, thing in the newspaper at that time and picture of Mr. Skarmarken sitting below his uh, new acquisition. <laughs> <laughs> and in the next version, version 5, also painted in 1853, uh, we can see that the composition is uh, very much like the one in version 4. This was commissioned by, by a German, um, Dr. Philos Lessing, in Berlin. And we also can notice that in this uh, version 5, there has been a change in the uh, landscape uh, in the background. He has, Gude has taken out the stave church and he has put in a white, um, whitewashed stone church. Um, we believe that Tidemann and Gude painted six, maybe seven, <laughs> versions of the bridal procession. But how they look, the two last ones, we do not know. But if you take a look at this photography at the screen, you can see that this is even the third version of the motif. Yeah. It's a third way of composing it, and that could be an uh, old photograph of version 6 or 7. Mm -hmm. So if you are confused now, <laughs> welcome to the club. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, really, we know very little yes. about en any of the other versions. Yes, seems. yes. Um, except, I think version 4 is the only other one that we know yeah. quite a bit about. Yeah. We've, we've seen yes. you know, recently. And, yes, yeah. yes. Um, but I mean, it just goes to show so many versions. This painting was really popular. Um, it, like we said, it was presented in a tableau vivant in uh, March 1848 when it came to Oslo. The first version was uh, presented in Dusseldorf. Yeah. And then, uh, and then this our version was presented in Oslo. Yes. In 1849. Yes. 
did I say 1848 last time? <laughs> 1848, nine. Yes. Um, I mean, it, could that be a reason for the popularity? I, I kind of think when you describe the ha, what a tableau vivant is, mm, mm. it's quite a cool, dramatic way to present art. I mean, it's like the olden day social media or something. Yes, like, you it know, is. Put yourself out there on Instagram. And <laughs> yeah. Yes, of course. And, and um, um, if you take a look at the screen now, you will see the ad for this... Uh, um, Tableau Vivant in Oslo. Uh, and uh, the ad also includes the music that goes with the showing the, the painting, because the painting was shown together with the, the Tableau Vivant. So the painting was also there, so that uh, the public could see the performance and the painting. Uh -huh. And um, um, Hans Gude was very fond of music. He was a very good friend of Halfdan Kjærulf. So Halfdan Kjærulf made the music for this uh, painting, or Tableau Viva. Oh. And also the author Andreas Munk made uh, the lyrics. The same that you heard as an introduction here today. Um, Gude, uh, he wrote a lot of letters back to his uh, fiancée, uh, later on wife. And he wrote Munk, Andreas Munk, wrote poetry to the living pictures, and we exhibited our newest paintings. We made the decorations, and Kjærulf wrote the music performed by young musicians. Ole Bull played at his best, and it was a big success. It was so successful, in fact, that we had to repeat the show several times. And the whole thing uh, took place in um, Christiania Theater, uh, you can see that also on the screen. Um, and of course, it was Ole Bull who played um, not only um, this music to Bru the bridal procession, but also his own pieces. Um, and uh, there was a huge man's choir singing the whole composition. And of course, the most beautiful girls were invited to sit in the boat. <laughs> of course. Yes. <laughs> and I mean, the, the, the theatre was, was large. I mean, there was yes. lots and lots of people must oh, have yeah. come to see it. And uh, it's, yeah, it's, um, it must have had a huge impact. I mean, I yeah. learned recently that there's, a, there's actually a memorial to this exact event yes. <laughs> in the centre of Oslo. There's a, a bust of the, of the composer Charouf and, uh, and Andreas Munch mm -hmm. um, and Tiedemann and Gude all in a, a little sort of courtyard together. Well, yes. Courtyard, little green area. Um, very near the National Gallery. Yes. yes. So it really must have had such an impact. Oh yeah, oh it's, yeah, uh, it must huge. have. Yes. Um, but you have done some very interesting technical researches on this. <laughs> Even more. Yeah. Even more, <laughs> yeah. But that's quite... For me, who doesn't know anything about this painting or whatever, it's, it's very interesting to see. Couldn't you tell us a yeah. bit about your... Yeah, because um, the, we, we also sort of discovered um, in our technical, technical examination various varnish layers. And, uh, and we were a bit intrigued by this. Didn't really know why, mm. because um, one of the... Yeah, there's one layer that's actually in between original paint layers, this intermediate varnish layer. Um, and uh, I think it's showing on your screens now two images of cross sections, which are microscopic samples of paint taken from that very edge of the painting. Um, and indicated with red arrows are these intermediate varnish layers between original paint layers. So I was kind of quite intrigued by of the timeline for this painting. Mm -hmm. Um, it was painted in 1848, spring probably roughly, um, arrived in Oslo on the 14th of June, 1848, mm -hmm. um, presented to the public in March 1849, uh, March 1849, but there was, it was also presented in, uh, in, in the autumn, like you said, in this lottery. Yes. Um, but it's, so there was sort of <laughs> some months in between each time it was, it was viewed and um, yeah, it's speculative again, um, but that the artists actually 
had to leave Dusseldorf before the painting was was really finished. Um, and the reason they might have had to leave uh, was because the the February Revolution um, in France had kind of spread to Germany, all these riots and everything. And and it might have been that they felt relatively unsafe and and could have escaped to Norway, back to Norway. And um, so it's possible they left sooner than they thought they might. Yeah. Um, the painting wasn't finished, and they then varnished the painting to protect it during its journey. And that's quite a common thing to do, actually, when, when, when art was being transported. Hmm. Um, and that then they actually carried on working on it back in Oslo uh, hmm. when, it, when it arrived in, in June, in between sort of when it, was, when it arrived and when it was then presented in the lottery, and again um, in March the following year. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. So it's kind of, it's quite interesting. You get such a sense of, of how they worked and, 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 and the timeline of it. Mm -hmm. and, so. Do you think there is also a possibility for they have, or Hans Gude has made a um, final varnish layer during the exhibition in 1895? Yeah, I think possibly because yeah. there's not just these intermediate varnish layers, but we found at least two varnish layers o overall mm -hmm. um, and I mean it was again very standard to varnish varnish painting when it was finished so presumably that was done either in time for the lottery yeah. um, or the or the tableau vivant in yeah. uh, March yeah. 1849 um, but equally then there's a second layer um, and so we were, when's this from and there's no documentation of course mm. uh, but we are assuming that it's quite likely that it got a sort of a freshening up yeah. varnish when yeah. it in 1895 because that was at the time it was sold to the National Gallery yeah so they'd have liked it to look kind of fresh and nice yeah. I imagine <laughs> for that sale <laughs> uh, maybe you should finish up with telling about how and why the National Gallery acquired this painting. Mm. Um, it was shown in an exhibition by uh, Hans Gude in 1895 in Oslo, and there was made a proposition for the National Gallery to buy it. But that wasn't that easy, because at this time, 50 years after it was finished, almost, it was rather out of fashion, or totally out of fashion. Yeah. <laughs> and and the, the committee, um, to decide this was not, uh, they, there was some who disagreed mm. that we should use money on this. But in the end, it was bought into the National Gallery for 3,000 kroner. And that is uh, around 25,000 euros in today's currency. And um, in less than 50 years since, it was first presented to the public. It was considered old fashioned, passe inartistic, faded flower of romanticism. Oh, wow, they were pretty negative. Yeah, you <laughs> I know. Mean, from what I gather, it really wasn't, uh, the, the, yeah, the, the National Gallery really did not think they were buying an, an, a piece of aesthetic art No. Um, at all. It was, uh, as one of the directors, later directors um, of the National Gallery wrote, uh, it was in 1937, mainly on account of the picture's exceptional significance in terms of the history of taste. Mm. Yeah, not so positive, and I think uh, even Jens Thies is even more, yes, <laughs> even more negative yes, about yes. it. Yes, Jens Thies became the first director of the National Gallery in 1909, but in 1904 he said, it seems too colourful and almost fake, with its polished colours and theatrical mood. Kind of tend to agree. <laughs> oh, okay, <laughs> it's very green yeah. water. Yes, right. it, and, and it's a bit polished. Yeah. Too. So, but 20 years later, the same Jens Thies was a bit more moderate and he said, one should, when faced with this artwork, not look so closely for technical mastery and painterly sophistication. As for a narrative talent, the ability to depict characters and a sense of harmony. Mm. And maybe this sense of harmony, um, the narrative, it's a story about this mm. young couple getting wed in this beautiful landscape. Maybe that is the reason for this being so strong in Norway. Yeah. This motive, this painting. Yeah. Every Norwegian has this on uh, their mind. Mm. 
And all of us, we know this painting from school books, from school, from advertising, whatever. Yeah, yeah, it must be the most known painting in Norway. I mean, aside from Edvard Munch's Scream. Yeah, um, yeah. It's, yeah. It's certainly, yeah. Yes. The, it's the national treasure. Yes, it is, it yeah. is. And, and there are um, been used in very many uh, connections, of course, advertising for apple juice or oh, yeah. whatever. <laughs> but, but also, um, if you see in the um, screen now, we have um, some examples on how it has been used uh, almost today um, in the struggle for the environment. Um, in, in the one to the left, you see a, uh, a painting by Rolf Groven, a Norwegian artist, who has um, made a comment to the oil nation Norway. And the other one, where they have put in these monster... Uh, wind turbines. Yes, <laughs> these huge, huge wind uh, things uh, that will appear in Norway here and there. But uh, we still consider this painting to be an important part of our identity, historical narrative. Um, and maybe this peaceful, wonderful and pristine landscape can just easily melt into our mm. whatever. Yeah. yeah, it's pretty easy to accept, you know, a nice, happy, happy image. Yes. Very Norwegian. Yes. The Norwegian-ness of Norway. Yeah, <laughs> it could be also a bit too much. But in two days we will celebrate our national day. Think about the bridal procession in Hardangefjord when you look at all the um, folk costumes uh, we are putting on on this day. Um, we are living in Norway around 5 million people and they are estimating that there are around 2.5 million folk costumes in Norway. So that means that every one of the adults, they have at least one <laughs> folk costume. Amazing. <laughs> Quite impressive. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, should we just uh, call it a day? I think we could. Yeah. Yes, we could take yes. some questions. Now yes, absolutely. With, uh... Questions. <laughs> yes, there's uh, actually quite a few questions. Oh. And there's a few concerning the um, guy with the rifle. Yes. <laughs> He's very popular in the comment section. Oh, mm -hmm. yeah. Um, was it a tradition to have? Someone with a rifle at this time at weddings? Yes. Um, the, the man is not hunting. Uh, he is, uh, he is uh, having uh, or he is telling about this big event, having a salute. Is that the yep, salute? Yeah. 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 But he is also having a very important other um, mission. He is shooting a bullet in silver above the newlywed couple to uh, scare away all, e all evil forces. That was very important. Mm -hmm. So they could lead a happy life together. Exactly. With no evil. Yeah. Good yeah. to know. <laughs> uh, there was a question if this was going to or from the church, but you kind of answered it because then they're newlyweds. So yes. it's after. Yes, it's <laughs> after. They are from going from the church and towards where they are celebrating. Good. Um, Ove Anders, what would be the commercial impacts of painting several versions of the same uh, or similar motifs, both for the artists and also with regard to the subsequent investment value? <laughs> uh, well, I mean, it's hard to say, isn't it, really? Uh, yeah. the, they seem clearly to be um, commissioned, or several of them were at least commissioned that we know. I mean, if we consider this the second that was commissioned by mm. Christiana Art Society, it's, um, it was commissioned, so therefore the, the, they were going to pay um, yeah. for it. Um, and uh, Dunke as well. Um, yeah. We don't know, do we know if he commissioned it? Um, yes. He did commission it himself. Yeah, I yeah. think so. Mm. Um, so again, there's, there's that side of it. I mean, it's... I, I, to me, this seems very different to, say, Edvard Munch, who did several versions of, uh, of, of several of his compositions, but seeming more for himself, yeah. I think, than, yeah. uh, than yeah. these. But yeah. um, I don't know, and there is great... 
thought that an original has more value, um, monetary mm. value, than, mm. uh, than copies. Um, but again, I think these are, we've sort of shown that it's not a copy um, in, the, in the sort of sense of the word copy. Um, mm. They're much more works in their own right. Um, so I don't think it's sort of about being the original is the only one that has any value. No. Um, it's, yeah. No, no, that's because they are so different. So then mm. it's not copies, as you it, say. Yeah. yeah. Mm. So I think they probably all have their own value. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Sophie is wondering, did the two artists know each other before they did the painting? Yes, they okay. met here in, in Lusty. Yeah. Um, five, five, five years uh, before, yeah. in 1843. Yeah, and then were in Dusseldorf between the, that period as well. They went yeah. back to Dusseldorf in 1843 and lived there, um, or not lived together, but they were both in Dusseldorf yeah. um, for, the, for that period as well. So mm. they probably got to know each other quite well before this. Absolutely. I think you'd have yeah. to. I don't think you could paint together this... Uh, no. This level, uh, this quality uh, without knowing each other, actually. No. no. Um, so, so a well-established collaboration. Yes, yeah. <laughs> certainly a well-established friendship before they did. Yes. Yeah. Okay. We'll do the last question from Lars Marius. In the first version, there is a man pouring some drink. In the later version, the boats are linked by what looks like a beer mug being handed from one boat to another. Mm -hmm. Thoughts on why this was included and seemingly emphasized so much in the later versions? Why it was emphasized? Yeah? yeah, that is, well, uh, having beer, making your own beer was a part of the tradition. Uh, when you knew you were having a party like the wedding, or it's not a party, it's a big thing, <laughs> then you were uh, obliged to actually make beer mm. and enough beer so that all the guests could have beer when they wanted. And this wedding was not only one afternoon, it went on for several days. So the beer, good beer, was uh, very important for the whole um, wedding. That's so cool. Yeah. I did not know that. No, <laughs> <laughs> no more questions, no? then we will that say was... bye. Yeah, thank, thank you. you very much for listening. Yes. <laughs> thank you all for watching. The next episode of Close Encounters is on the 15th of June and the topic will be announced next week. Thank you all for watching and have a nice weekend. <laughs>